and uh, uh, the talks with uh, uh, talks about uh, finite groups. And the next speaker, Anton Baikalov from the University of Auckland, will speak about the intersection of soluble subgroups and finite groups. Please start. Uh, thank you. So uh, today I will speak about the problem uh, I was working on during my PhD at the University of Auckland. And I will start uh, with introducing the problem, then we'll show you some recent results, and in particular, my recent results, and maybe if there is still time, we'll talk about um, my proof and methods a bit. Okay, let's start. Yeah, as it mentioned in a uh, topic, uh, all groups here are going to be finite. So, uh, let Psi be some property of finite groups inherited by all subgroups. For example, it can be commutativity, nil potence, or solvability. A natural question to ask is how big is a normal Psi subgroup in, in the finite group G? Well, let's formulate it a bit more precise. So assume that we have a final group G and we have some Psi sub, subgroup in it of index n. Is it true that G has a normal size subgroup uh, whose index is bounded by some function f of n? Well, uh, there is good news. The answer to this question is yes, because it's quite easy to show that n factorial always works. Uh, but this bound is not that nice and it's in particular, not very useful. So in search of a more useful bound, Bobby Goodman and Pieber in 1997 asked the following question. So given, again, the final group G with Psi subgroup of index N, is it true that G has a normal Psi subgroup whose index is at most N to power C for some absolute constant C? And different people were working on this question in different times and for different psi, and some we have some answers actually. Uh, for example, if psi is cyclicity, then we know the best possible actually f, it's n squared minus n. Well, it's not exactly of this form, but it's polynomial. Uh, if psi is commutativity, then n squared suffices, and if psi is nil potency, then n cube suffices. Um, as you probably already guessed uh, from the name of my talk, I'm interested in the case when uh, psi is um, solvability. And so far, no nice bound is known. Um, but in the same paper, uh, Baba e. Goodman and Pieber um, conjectured that uh, seven should be enough. Seven should work. They actually prove, proved in the same paper that some constant exists, that some C exists here. Uh, but from their proof, uh, one cannot find any nice C. Uh, so they just probably looked at some examples and conjectured that seven should work. Uh, I have no idea why uh, seven. So, okay. Uh, how one can approach uh, such a problem? So we, we want to find a suitable C. So, okay, we have S, which is soluble subgroup in G. It is natural to look at the core subgroup of S, which is just intersection of all conjugates of S and G. This subgroup is, of course, also soluble and, of course, normal. So usually it is a case that we don't have to take all the conjugates to, to get to our SG. And sometimes, well, just few, let's say M uh, conjugates are enough to get SG. And it also an easy exercise to show that if there is there are m conjugates 
uh, which give you an intersection SG. Then um, index of SG is strictly less than index of S to the power of M. Um, so it means that if we find some small M such that always uh, M conjugates is enough, then we can find nice and small C. So uh, let us denote by B S of G the minimal B such that there exist uh, B conjugates of S whose intersection is S G. And um, Vdovin in Korovka notebook asked the following question. So if S is a maximal soluble subgroup of G, is it true that B S of G uh, is not greater than five? So um, if, if this is true, then it means that we always can find five conjugates here, and then C is not greater than five always, and we solve the problem. So five here came from the fact that there is example when it's exactly five, and no examples when it's more than five is known. Um, there, there are actually infinitely many examples when uh, base of G is exactly five. So um, here I supposed to go to, to the results which are already known. Yeah, so this problem uh, from Korovka notebook, it's the one I want to concentrate on. Um, but yes, before in introducing some results, I will have to introduce some uh, definitions. And in particular, I will define B S of G again. So assume that finite group G acts on a set omega. Um, I would like to remind you that a point from omega is G regular if it's stabilizer in G is trivial. And let us define an action, the action of G on omega to M, just coordinate ways. So if G acts faithfully and transitively on omega, then the minimal number M such that omega to M contains a G regular point is called a base size of G denoted by B of G. Um, and um, a regular point on omega M is a base uh, for this action. So we denote the number of G regular orbits, distinct orbits on omega to M by reg G of M. Uh, so if there is no regular orbits, it means that uh, M is less than uh, base size, then of course this number is zero. So now if we again have our finite group G and it's subgroup S, G then acts of course by right multiplication on omega and a quotient group by SG acts faithfully transitively. So in this case, we denote BS of G, the base size of this action and reg S, G of M, number of uh, regular orbits uh, of this action on omega to M. So yeah, you already probably noticed that we introduced BS of G again, uh, because uh, as most of you probably know, uh, the, stabili um, the stabilizer of the point of, of a coset is a, uh, S conjugated with G. Um, so stabilizer of a point in omega to M is intersection of conjugates uh, of S. So yeah, these definitions are here to introduce this number, uh, which will appear soon. So again, back to our problem. 
uh, we want to show that bs of g uh, is not greater than five when s is the maximal solvable subgroup of a finite group g. So this problem is reduced by Vdoven to the case when g is al almost simple and uh, specifically to, to prove that bs of g for uh, any finite group and its maximal soluble subgroup S is not greater than M. It suffices to show that for every almost simple group G and its soluble subgroup S, uh, this number, which we just in introduced of distant regular orbits of G on omega to M is at least five. So um, if we want to show that BS of G is not greater than five, then we need to show that for every alma simple group G and its soluble subgroup S, uh, reg S of G five is at least five. So we need at least five regular points and we want M here to be five because that's our conjecture. Uh, okay, some more results of it. So first of all, technical lemma, uh, it's quite easy to show that if BS of G is not greater than four, then we always can construct five regular uh, orbits on omega to five. So we have one, at least one regular orbit on omega to four, then we can construct five regular orbits on omega to five. Uh, okay, now let's go to, to actual results. Uh, this is my result from my masters. Um, I proved that if G is almost simple with so-called isomorphic to alternating group, uh, then the necessary equality holds. And in particular, uh, BS of G is not greater than five always. Then the very recent result by Tim Bernays, uh, he proved that if G is almost simple, with sporadic circle, uh, then uh, BS of G is not greater than three. And by, by lemma one, we obtain the necessary inequality. Um, another also very recent result by Bernays. Um, here it's a bit tricky because we, we considering here maximal solvable subgroups and here, uh, he considers solvable subgroups, which are maximal. So they not just maximal solvable, they are maximal subgroups of uh, almost simple groups. Um, it's, there is actually a quite explicit list when it happens for uh, almost simple groups. And he, he could show that uh, base size here, not greater than five, and actually equality, so five uh, here only in these cases. And it's quite easy to show that um, the inequality, this inequality holds there as well. Um, this result is a bit trickier to understand. So this result is about, about uh, maximal subgroups. Uh, they don't have to be solvable. Um, the thing is that we can use results about maximal subgroups because, of course, uh, any soluble subgroup lies in the maximal subgroup of uh, almost simple group. And if there are four, for example, conjugates uh, of this maximal subgroup, which intersects trivially, then we, of course, can take just the same uh, elements and conjugate uh, our soluble subgroup with them and the intersection will be still um, trivial. So uh, here uh, Bernays considers the case when H is maximal um, subgroup and it's non-subspace subgroup, which basically uh, with some exceptions means that it's a subgroup not uh, from 
class h by hex class c1. Well, g is here is a simple classical group. So it means, roughly speaking, that h doesn't stabilize any subgroups. Uh, the reason for this is simple because when if we take a subspace subgroup, for example, parabolic group, uh, base size is actually not bounded there. So it's just impossible to prove um, the same result for maximal uh, subgroups, which are subspace subgroups. Um, but for non-subspace non subgroups, it works. So if our soluble subgroup lies in the maximal non-subspace subgroup, uh, then we can use this result. And in particular, base size is not greater than four, unless this really specific case holds when, when it's five. Um, well, I mentioned this result because my results are also about uh, classical groups, in particular, uh, almost simple groups with linear, unitary, and symplectic circle. So uh, I will now pass to my results. So first result is kind of um, enhancement of improvement of this result, because I also consider here irreducible maximal soluble subgroup. So my subgroup also non-subspace subgroup um, of GLN, uh, GUN, or GSPN. So general linear unitary or symplectic group. Um, and I prove here that with some sm small list of exceptions, uh, base size is two for linear groups and it's not greater than three for uh, unitary and symplectic groups. So why I needed this improvement? Because you, you could say that oh, you need five and this result is good enough why you that don't just use that. Well, because for general case, because I'm interested in general case with, uh, without um, this condition of non subspace. Um, in the proof of uh, general case, I use this result and for is not not enough. I, I, I need I need better estimates for irreducible subgroups. So, and second result is the main result, the main formulation of it. So, if G is almost simple, find a group with circle isomorphic to uh, projective to P PSL, PSU, or PSP, um, and S is maximal soluble subgroup of G, then necessary condition holds. Um, in particular, uh, by size, of course, not greater than five. Um, now, of course, this theorem consists of at least three theorems and actually a bit more because there are more details. Uh, in some situations, the results are actually nicer than just, just, just this. So let, let's look at them. So start, of course, with linear case. So here, X is gamma L, which is um, JLN uh, extended by field automorphisms. And yeah, here I managed to prove the necessary condition. Um, yeah, I will just remind you that if we take uh, to, to obtain automorphism group of uh, PSL and Q, we can take JLN, extend it by field automorphism. And if N is at least three, then extend it by graph automorphism, with which we can take the inverse transpose map and then question it by uh, scalars and we will get an uh, automorphism group of uh, PSL and Q. So that's not the full uh, auto automorphism group. So second theorem, if n at least three and x is uh, gel and um, gamma L and Q extended by an inverse transpose map um, and S 
is a maximal solvable subgroup not contained in uh, gamma L, because if it's contained, we just use theorem one. Then, um, well, if it's not contained in gamma L, um, then the results are actually nicer. And I managed to prove that here base size is not greater than four, unless this really specific case um, holds. Um, here it's five and with regular orbits, everything is fine. Um, then for unitary groups, that's enough. Here we don't, don't have any additional graph automorphisms. And here as well, uh, in most cases, uh, I managed to prove that uh, base size is not greater than four, unless this case happens. Um, and for symplectic cases, I proved that it always by size is not greater than four. Um, so basically when um, by size hits five in linear, unitary and symplectic uh, cases, it's one, one case in unitary groups and in linear groups, uh, if S doesn't lie in gamma L, also just one case. Uh, but if it doesn't, then uh, just the general statement is uh, all I could manage to prove. Um, so that's that's my results. So for almost simple groups with uh, linear unit against symplectic circle, uh, everything is fine and question is closed here. Um, I still have some time so we can actually talk about methods of the proofs. So let's start with theorem one. Um, here for a basic case. So when S is primitive, linearly primitive, subgroup of G or quasi-primitive, it doesn't really matter what exactly it means. You can think about primitive uh, subgroups. Uh, then I use a probabilistic method. And so let Q, G, C be a prob probability that a randomly chosen C tuple of uh, points in omega is not a base of G. Of course, if we can show that uh, this probability is less than one, it means that there is a C tuple which is base for G. Uh, and um, this probability we can estimate by, by the following thing. Here, FPR is fixed point ratio, which is ratio of fixed points by uh, element x, uh, and uh, this sum is taken uh, by all elements of prime order and um, in G. So um, using this estimate, so basically to use it, what what we need to know, we need to know sizes of uh, conjugacy classes of uh, points. Of, of elements of prime order and um, sizes of their intersections with S. And in this case, uh, in when S is primitive subgroup, uh, everything here is under control. So it's actually uh, not that hard to, to use this method and get it through. So then further, if S is imprimitive, then my proof is uh, constructive in, in the following sense. So for example, let's take linear case. So as if S is in primitive, it means that it lies in some um, Reef product where S1 is a primitive subgroup in JLM. Um, and then by previous step, we know 
uh, that intersection of two conjugates that there is some element from JLM uh, which uh, gives us um, um, scalar matrices and intersection. So in this case, uh, we can take um, Kronecker product of x1 and y, where y is k by k Jordan block, and we can show that uh, this intersection also lies in, uh, in the center of JLN. And um, the next, list, so that's how the theorem basically for unitary and symplectic groups, the construction is different by, but in, in the same spirit. Um, now, if we go to reducible subgroups, um, I will also show you example uh, on linear groups. So uh, if H is subgroup in JLN, then in some basis, uh, matrices from H are upper block diagonal, I look at, uh, I call it. So we have blocks uh, on diagonal. Each block is uh, basically uh, corresponds to irreducible representation from H to JLN I. And um, yeah, of course, if H is solvable, then all projections um, H I's are also solvable. Um, so then, um, if for every H I using a previous step, because they are reducible, uh, we can find X I from S L N I such that intersection lies in right. Um, well, this is upper triangle or matrices or right triangle matrices, but we even know that in most cases it's just uh, scalar matrices. Then it uh, we can construct matrices X, S, y, X and Y such that this holds. So uh, and D is a set of uh, diagonal matrices. Um, so we have intersection of four conjugates which lies in diagonal matrices. And then uh, final lemma um, shows that if N is reducible, it actually stabilizes some uh, subspace. Uh, then uh, there exists Z, which is also found constructively in uh, most situations, such that uh, H to Z intersects with diagonal matrices uh, by scalar matrices. So that's a rough plan. There are much more technical details of it, but that, that's the rough idea uh, how I approached it. And of course, for unitary and symplectic uh, groups, uh, there is much more details which are um, using uh, geometric stuff. Uh, that's why actually, because I, I could use geometric stuff, the results are nicer there that in most cases I uh, could obtain um, BS of G uh, to be not greater than four. Um, and yeah, I would like to stop here. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. We have time for one small question, if there is some. I have a question. Yes, certainly. Thank you for your talk. Uh, yep. As I understand, the general uh, problem uh, is redu that is reducing to five conjugated subgroups is solved when uh, the, the circle is isomorphic to alternating groups so or the groups, these three series on the slide. And do you think that methods you used can be useful uh, when the circle is 
has a morphic to other series or sporadic groups? Um, yeah, uh, well, sporadic groups are also it was somewhere, really sporadic short. groups are also uh, closed uh, by Bernays. Um, actually, the only opened cases are in classical groups. It's orthogonal groups and um, exceptional groups of the type. Um, so for orthogonal groups, I think one can uh, prove that this equation uh, following my steps. Uh, the amount of technical work is there, I, I believe is uh, greater than for these cases. Um, but I think that the same ideas uh, will work there. For um, uh, for exceptional groups of the type, um, I don't know. I don't think so because my methods my methods are really constructive, and I use um, matrix representations a lot. I I don't see how it can be directly used in uh, exceptional groups. <laughs>